and the batteries are in. Okay, um, my name's John O'Shea. I'm an artist. Uh, a lot of you already know me. Um, my talk this afternoon, we had talks this morning concerned with leadership, and we've kind of had talks to do with uh, birth and death today. Um, so my talk is concerned more with, um, in the first part, mob mentality, and also in the second part, the, the fine line between living and, and non-living. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is Pig's Bladder Football, which is a live project that I'm working on at the moment. So some of this stuff is, is in development, and it's the first time that, I, that I've shared it. Um, these people here, um, these are the champions of the first game of pig's bladder football to happen during the 21st century. Okay? They don't look that happy. That's because they don't know yet that they've won. This, this was taken before. On um, the left, as you're looking, is Ellie, who was the captain of that team, who scored quite a contentious goal in the semi-final and um, got the team into the final. And she got to keep the ball as a consequence. And um, her comment regarding pig's bladder football is that it's disgusting and cool, uh, which is something that I, I want to get on a t-shirt. Um, these are some clips uh, from uh, a short film that Tim Brunsden made of the first ever game of pig's bladder football to happen in the 21st century. It happened at something called Egremont Crab Fair, which is a 700-year-old festival of eccentricity that happens in the northwest of England in Cumbria, in Egremont. Uh, happened every year for 700 years. You might have heard of it because it, was, it is the place where the World Gurning Championships happens. Um, but we brought this along. There was no better place to sort of start this, I thought. Um, uh, I refereed. This is a kind of a bit of a 1966 World Cup moment that happened during one of the games. You can't really see here, but the, these were the winning team, but children played on a level playing field, well, fairly level, with adults. They competed with adults. Um, the ball, it's not perfect. It doesn't bounce properly. You can't do particularly you know, um, flamboyant skills with it. Um, you have to be a bit brave to head it. Um, and it was fantastic. And so the question is, you know, why on earth do this? Um, and one reason would be, um, simple answer, life's ambition. Okay, as, as a young child, my dad told me about um, his uh, upbringing in, in rural Ireland and how they would slaughter the pig and then they would play football with the bladder. And for somebody growing up in Huddersfield in the north of England, an industrial town, um, that just seemed so far detached from my life experience um, that this was something I wanted to, to get involved with and, 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 um, and, and find out about myself. I, I'm not somebody who believes that um, experience is the only way of uh, acquiring knowledge, but I think it's an important way. So, uh, how do you do that? How do you make pig's bladder footballs? Well, um, you need to go to your local abattoir, um, and you need to speak to them and you need to say, look, we, we need some uh, bladders uh, and we're going to make footballs out of them. But in the, the 21st century, that's, that's a bit more challenging than it would have been when there were you know, abattoirs everywhere and people were slaughtering their, their own animals even. It's quite difficult to get bladders uh, now because of licensing around offal. Offal is, is seen as a dangerous thing. Also, it's difficult to go to abattoirs because of um, ideas around um, hiding some of the processes that, that are quite normal. Um, and also, it's quite difficult just to, just to have that conversation. This was an early prototype. Um, this isn't a pig's bladder. I said to them I wanted a pig's bladder. They interpreted that, that I actually wanted a pig's stomach. Um, so what you're seeing there is an inflated pig's stomach, and I, and I had to go back to the drawing board. I went back to the abattoir maybe four or five times before I got the right thing, because they would, obviously they're bladders, so they would puncture them to get the, the wee out, you know, but that's not too good for, for making footballs 
Also, they would cut the tube at the top and you, you couldn't tie it. But uh, anyway, progressed with it, um, did some research into very, um, very, very ancient processes, actually, four and five hundred year old processes, learning recipes for how to make these footballs out of pig's bladders, and then took to the streets with it and ran some workshops where the public could get involved in it. This uh, lady here, she, she looks in a state of shock, but I think she was just adjusting her mask, actually. Um, we did uh, these workshops as a, as a kind of live research to find out how to make footballs out of pig's bladders in the 21st century, because there are lots of different approaches. Uh, this was up in Egremont again. This was all part of Abandoned Normal Devices Festival. Um, and this also was uh, at the London 2012 Open Weekend for the Olympics. Um, and these are some of the footballs that people made, given the ingredients and given some prompts. So we went through different historic processes that I was aware of, of how to make pig's bladder footballs. So the top left one has uh, dried peas in, um, which, which were used. Uh, the middle one, obviously you filled bladders with air and we wanted to try something like that, but, but we tried something a bit different. We filled it with helium. Um, the top right um, is filled with wool flock, and I'll talk about that a bit later. The bottom left two are filled with hay. Um, you'll see the bottom left one needed stitching up because the bladder tore, and this was kind of a smaller one that somebody made. And what we talked about was the materials of these balls, the different structures and the different weights and the different ways that they're made, how does that then influence the kind of game that you might have? So, so working from the materials, what different kinds of uh, activities might these balls lend to? Maybe some of them are more just decorative. Some of them, the small ones, you could even hide on your person. You know, things like this. Um, and this is the, uh, the wool flock ball being, being made. And wool flock is like a fine kind of linen. It's used in upholstery. Um, that, um, this chap in the middle is called Joe Clark. And he plays a game called uppies and downies which still happens, which is in the, happens in Workington, um, and it's a kind of mob football game with, with no rules, basically. Um, and they fill their ball with this wool flock material. So that's Joe and his daughter and his granddaughter, because it's, it's great family fun getting involved with, uh, with animal intestines, you know, out in the sunshine. Um, and this is part of something that I'm quite interested in. It feels as if, in, in my lifetime, it feels as if there's been a gradual quite a severe sanitization of experience where encountering something like this would seem odd. Um, and, and hence, you know, I did this activity in public because I think, you know, to be doing this in your bedroom would be a bit odd. Um, this is the game of uppies and downies. Basic premise, uh, one group of people need to get the ball up to the hall on the hill. The other group uh, need to get the ball down to the harbour, about two miles between, rivers, forests, um, fields. Uh, it's a tough game. There's no rules, okay? No rules. There's no outfits. You don't know who's on what team. I, I promise you in the middle of there is a ball. I know that because I, I took part in the game. It's tough. You can see on the left there, it's too tough even for Superman. Okay? <laughs> This is the ball that they use, okay? As I say, this ball is made out of a kind of saddle leather, a very stiff type of leather. And the guy who makes these now, Mark Rawlinson, he spends 40 hours making that ball. And it's actually changed over, over time. It used to be filled with horsehair, but the ball goes into the water, and so the horsehair ball doesn't float. Whereas the, the wool flock ball, it leaves a bit of air in there, and so it floats a bit. So the, also, the, um, the leather work is incredibly tough because it, otherwise the ball will tear. So that ball is for that game and the two things are totally interrelated. So we're going to do a quick cobbled together history lesson now, not really based on any proper research, but just, uh, just based on, on balls, basically. Uh, so um, as I say, the, the Workington ball, the uppies and downies ball, if we see that as kind of the 
the fundamental origin of football as we imagine it. Uh, this is a still from a film I made with Tim Brunsden. You can have a look at that online. That's called Uppies and Downies. So there's the Workington ball. Let's have a look at the balls we've got now. Oh, we'll go back one. This is, uh, this is a rugby ball, okay? These balls, at some stage, the rugby football organizers decided what we want is a ball that we can throw easily and that we can hold on to nicely. And also, the shape is a bit odd because what we want is the ball to bounce in unpredictable ways. And that reminds us that chance is actually a really key part of the game we're playing. The Americans, the American football, they decided that they wanted to throw the ball forward. And so they retained the laces on the ball so that they could grip it with one hand and get a spin onto it so they go really quite far. And the, the football, which would be most familiar to most of us, um, soccer, soccer ball for our, our American viewers. Um, this is the football which we use. And, and basically, at some point, it was decided the most important thing is that this was spherical. We want a really spherical ball. And this got to the point at the last World Cup with this Adidas Jubilani football, where the ball was almost perfectly spherical. And it came in for unprecedented criticism because it was deemed to be too perfect. So that, that's where we're at. Um, Going to give you a little sort of um, map out some of those trajectories now, how we got to that football. Um, well, this is how FIFA measure footballs, incredibly scientifically. Circumference, roundness, rebound, water absorption, weight. This is their equipment down at Loughborough. Um, the people at FIFA actually got in contact with me to find out if one of the pig's bladder balls I've been making, how did I think that would stand up to their tests, their 450 measurements? And they were writing a paper, um, but I said it'd be quite a short paper. You know, it just, it wouldn't, okay? This is the ball I grew up with. This is a Mitre Delta football, which was used in the Football League up until 1992. These footballs were made in my hometown of Huddersfield. They're made from leather. In 1992, a new league was formed in, the, in England, which is a Premier League, which is an elite footballing league, and it is the number one league in the world. And to coincide with the, the Premier League, a new football was released, the Ultimax, which was the first ever fully synthetic football to be used in a professional league anywhere in the world. So it had a synthetic internal bladder and a synthetic outer casing. And Mitre talk about how the, the leather football was consigned to history. And it's made of, of plastic. And if we think about the Premier League, that came in, we got stadiums with plastic seats. And I, I can understand why they made the ball out of synthetic materials in 1992. It, it seemed like the right thing to do. It was progress. 1992, people were wearing shell suits. You know, they were wearing plastic clothes. You know, this is a time of plastic. But my thinking is, 20 years on, maybe if we're going to make that decision again, maybe that's not what we need to do. And maybe in 2012, we could take a different trajectory and we could think, what about if we had a ball which used biotechnology, an organic football? And I've been thinking about that and I, I you know, what I do, I get involved in stuff. Um, and so I started to properly get involved in, in the notion of uh, what would it mean to have a, a ball made using biotechnology? And so for the last six months, down the road here, I've been working in a clinical engineering laboratory um, with processes of tissue culture. And all that tissue culture is, is growing animal cells outside of animals. You're growing them in a laboratory. And the way that you're doing that is you're, you're introducing a medium which gives them everything they need. Uh, that's very important, it feeds them. The other thing that you're doing is you're keeping them in a controlled environment. So, you're uh, maintaining the temperature in an incubator. 
you're controlling the CO2 levels, and most importantly, you're preventing infection. And that's the reason why it's a little bit difficult to do this sort of stuff in your kitchen. Uh, because it's so, so um, highly likely that the cells will get infected and they'll die. These are the cells I've been learning with. This is what most people who learn tissue culture use. So these are L929 fibroblasts. What fibroblasts are is a type of um, connective tissue cell. It's not a stem cell, okay? It's, it's a cell which has a fixed purpose and, and it grows as a, as a kind of connective tissue. These ones, um, when I went into the lab, they'd been in a, a cryogenic freezing facility just in the back of the thing in the lab for about eight years. And I don't really know too much about the mouse that these cells came from. And, and there's, there's kind of, to me, there's quite profound ethical questions about, about that whole idea of, of using cells in this way. But as I say, I prefer to think about ethics by getting my hands dirty, and, 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 or at least getting them a little bit wet and, and getting involved. And so this is, this is basically how, you, how your cells grow. Um, why on earth, as an artist, do I even feel like I could even do this sort of thing? Well, kind of a little bit fortunate, really. I have um, a background training in media art, working uh, with media. And so it's my expectation as an artist that artists will get involved in things that are traditionally for specialists. Artists got involved in making films, they got involved in making photographs, they got involved in building the internet. Um, and so, you know, why wouldn't artists get involved with uh, scientific processes? And then, living in Liverpool, in the, in the, in the northwest of England, very, very fortunate. Um, you know, I pay attention to what's on my doorstep, and I'm the first to critique uh, the cultural institutions in this city, but we have some fantastic cultural institutions. And uh, Fact, in 2008, did a show called Skin to Faces. And Skin to Faces, the curator Jens Hauser brought together internationally the most amazing practitioners you can imagine of artists working with life sciences. And I was, I was quite intimidated by it. You had uh, Stellark, who, who you'll all probably, be, he's the guy with the ear on his arm. And, and you had Orlan, the, the French um, female artist working with um, plastic surgery on her own face. Um, and, and I thought, you know, what, what the hell is this? This seems just... I'll, get, I'll go and have a look. And then I found out about a whole load of other artists who were in this show. Uh, I'm not going to be able to remember them all, but uh, people like um, St Steve Kurtz with Critical Art Ensemble, Kira O'Reilly, Art Orient Objet, and, and I got to meet this guy, a uh, Polish artist, Zbigniew Oksuta, and spend a bit of time with him. And his whole philosophy is to do with thinking about natural architectures, natural membranes as an architecture. And he, he's worked on that for, for decades. Uh, very, very powerful ideas of a kind of emergent architecture rather than a rigid architecture, which he bases on the structure of cells. Also, in the show uh, was this piece of work by Tissue Culture and Art, um, Ian Zur and Oren Katz. And this piece of work, in a way, these, these practitioners, in a way, have kind of mapped out the whole field or a massive part of the field of artists working with life sciences. Uh, and for this piece, they, it's called Victimless Leather. It's tissue culture grown in the, in the art gallery space rather than in a science laboratory space demonstrated live for you. Um, and what you've got is you've got a kind of polymer scaffold in the shape of a, a jacket. And then you've got living cells growing onto that scaffold. And, and what it's sort of doing is it's sort of pointing if, I mean, it's, it's a piece of art. It does a lot of things. But, it, but for me, it's pointing to notions about a future where we might actually further abstract the violence of using animals for products and food. You know, uh, in this, you know I have leather shoes, you know, and we, we take animals and we kill them and we make the shoes, but, but we don't talk about that bit of it that much. And so 
a tissue cultured approach would allow us to even further not talk about it. And so this piece of work was absolutely fascinating to me. And I went and had a chat with them. And, um, and in the end, I ended up going to a laboratory they set up in Norway and doing a master class for a week and um, kind of working there. I don't know, I've had that expression in both of those pictures. And based on <laughs> earlier today, I don't, I don't quite know what that means. Um, but basically, for a week, I got to spend time with lots and lots of other really, really smart people who were, who were coming at this stuff from a lot of different angles. Um, so that's some of the way that I got involved in this stuff. Another part of it is the northwest of England might be known internationally um, as historically as the birthplace of um, the Industrial Revolution. And also a city like Liverpool historically had a hugely important uh, shipping and dock industry. But right now, this area is a global leader in biotechnology, but you wouldn't really know it. Um, the way that I found out about that is through people uh, who are based here in Liverpool, scientists, artists, ethicists, um, the cultural programmers, some really incredible people who, who've supported me in putting this project together. And uh, you know, there, isn't, there isn't time to name them all. Um, so what, let's get cut to the chase. What, what is it I actually want to do? OK, we've got, oh, we've, we've got a little bit of time, but not a lot. OK, what I want to do is I want to grow a football for the 21st century using processes of tissue culture. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to start with a patch-based approach, and then I'm going to move towards a um, 3D method, and, and we'll see where we get. And um, what I did, I graduated past the mouse cells, um, went back to the abattoir, and I said to him, I, I need a, a pig's leg. Uh, and he looked at me a bit funny, because he knows that I don't eat meat. But I said, no, no, I'll, I have some friends who will be perfectly happy to take the meat bit. You know, and here they are, they were delighted. But what I actually needed was, um, was the, the pig's knee. And so what we were able to do, very, very simply, in the laboratory down the road here, uh, not a new process at all, was to take bone marrow from inside the knee of the pig. This, I mean, you don't need my word to say that's dead. Um, you know, it, it died on the Monday. Um, this is the Tuesday. And then, um, we extracted this bone marrow, and, and, and we've been growing, culturing, incubating, and growing um, stem cells from the knee of this pig uh, down the road. Uh, this is a picture from the, a few days down the line where we'd filtered out a lot of the, um, the sort of debris, and what we were left with were actually, all that we could see were two cells. So we had two cells to start with. And two days ago, I went back into the lab, performed a count, and we had 1,125,000 cells to the nearest quarter of a million. Um, so we're growing them. That's what we're doing. There's about six months until this project sort of has a public uh, manifestation as part of Abandoned Normal Devices Festival. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to show uh, yeah, a, a 21st century football. Um, these are some of the people who I need to thank. Uh, and Festival, the Wellcome Trust who have supported this, and Liverpool University who I'm in residence with, and also the, we got this mark to say that this is part of the, the Cultural Olympiad as well. And um, tune in via Twitter if you want to hear about the stuff in the lab, and if you want to find out any more, there's the blog. Thank you.